if you want to. Let's see here. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you. We're going to start off singing number 261. <clears throat> number 261, I am thine, O Lord. <clears throat> I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith 
and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. <clears throat> number 788 <clears throat> number 788 wonderful words of life and after this we'll have our opening prayer <clears throat> sing them over again to me wonderful words of life let me more of their beauty see wonderful words of life Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Shall I pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us and Thank you for all the blessings you bestow upon us every day. And Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together to learn more about your word. Father, we 
come at this time and ask that you be with Eddie Watts as he received word today from his doctor. Be with Connie Watts as she is about to undertake a surgery. Be with the Harrell family. Be with the Forehand family. Father, be with all those that have been mentioned in the announcements. And Father, we ask that you be with each and every one of us. Forgive us of our sins. For it's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Number 440. Number 440. My Jesus, I love thee. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love Thee because Thou hast first loved me. And purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Our song of encouragement will be number 356, Jesus is Tenderly Calling. <clears throat> Still in the mode of trying to figure out, <laughs> get in the routine here, so bear with me. Good to see everyone tonight. <laughs> My wife's glad to see me anyway. <laughs> oh boy. Let me try that again. Good evening. Good evening. It's great to see all of you here this evening. I hope and trust you've had a good week so far. And uh, always a great opportunity to come together in the midweek and get built back up and encouraged, I hope, and uh, be able to go out and uh, have more power to go the rest of the week, right? And uh, so, yeah, I'm glad to see all of you here. Lee, Lee, <laughs> Lee made a remark. I'm going to just start off with this tonight, Lee. Your remark last week, would you care to repeat that? <laughs> the one about the women.
<laughs> okay, so Denise and I discussed this, what you were meaning by that. But you said something to the effect, we were talking about evolution, you said something to the effect that, I thought you were talking about evolving into a woman. I'm thinking, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole, you know, not going there. And then Denise said, well, I think you had in mind our current situation where men are evolving into <laughs> women, it seems like, uh, the whole transgender thing. I got to thinking about your point, and I think think about something else, though, that, you know, we talk about evolution of the species, how absolutely incredibly impossible it is, right? But there's a little, that's a little extra something there to think about here. It's not just about evolving one little cell into a monkey, into a man, whatever, but there's also the female part of the species, right? So at what point do these two single the little cells that are now multiplying, did they decide we need to start replicating, a diff reproducing a different way? <laughs> we need another gender. Why, how and what possible mechanism could they have come up with to make them do that? Let's start, and at what point do they finally get to the point where they now have the reproductive organs to reproduce a different way and why would they ever think about that you know it's just the whole thing is so bizarre and takes such a leap to come to that to believe in something like that anyway I thought maybe that's what you had in mind I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt there but something to think about something else to think about I want to go back I really had hoped to get through all of this material last week and get on to dinosaurs but we didn't quite make it so I want to go back and uh, pick up and finish up this part on the question is whether or not evolution or God, and I started off, I think, um, so there we go. Is evolution a fact? And of course the scientific community all wants us to believe that it is a fact, right? Not all the, and I'm using this term generally scientific because you know there are a lot of people that are in the scientific community don't believe in evolution. Mike Sullivan is a, worked as a, teaching science, and he doesn't believe in that, right? So um, we had, Denise and I had some great professors at Fried Hardeman that didn't believe in that, in biology and chemistry. Anyway, so not everybody, but most, and I'm using that generic way, scientists want us to believe it's a fact. This guy says evolution of the animal and plant world is considered by all those entitled, which means you're entitled if in fact you believe in evolution, then you're entitled. Entitled to a judgment to be a fact for which no further proof is needed. So we talked about that. Is it a fact? And I pointed out that evolution is outside the realm of science, of true science, because to begin with, it's limited to the observable. Do you remember the empirical data? I've got to see, touch, taste, to be able to measure something. But you can't do that with the beginning. Nobody can observe that. Nobody can has observed evolution going through the process, life forming, things changing. So it's limited to some, it's, it, so you can't do that. It's limited to the present, can't go back all the way to the beginning. And not only that, but it cannot deal with unique situations such as the beginning of life. And we talked about all this last week. And then I mentioned that there are four great obstacles for the evolutionists. First is cosmic evolution, the origin of the first material. Where do you get the first hydrogen atom or whatever it is, the first element? Of course, they want us to believe you came from nothing. But, and we'll talk about this more when we get into thinking about God, maybe. But what do you get from nothing? You get nothing. And so there's no way you could have gone from nothing to all of a sudden having the hydrogen atom or whatever it was that it began with. But then, you got it, once you get past, you got the first little atom of some material, then how do you get all the other materials? 118 of them in the periodical table? So how do we go from one to all those different chemicals and elements? And then you got a, the chemical to life evolution. How do I take all of those chemicals and get them to turn into a life cell? Something that scientists have never been able to replicate in the laboratory for all their efforts, but we're supposed to believe this just happened, right, by accident. And then if you could get to the point where we actually had a cell <laughs> 
a living cell. How do you get that living cell to turn into nine million plus different life forms on this planet? That's a big jump, isn't it? So they've got some big things to overcome here before you can believe in this. And I've, again, my thesis is it takes a lot more faith to believe in this than to believe I have a creator who made everything like it is. Anyway, so we went into, started talking about Darwin and uh, I defined evolution for you being the change. We agreed that minor changes happen, you know. Um, a group of people moved to Sweden years ago and they all have, most of them have blonde hair and so they started intermarrying and so all the people over there end up having blonde hair, all right? But that's not evolution. That is just because one of the gene, the gene for blonde hair was the dominant gene and all those people who had that dominant gene intermingled and intermarried and so you had the dominant gene. But it wasn't one animal turning into another animal. Minor changes in appearance, sure, but not species changes, a monkey to a man or a dinosaur to a chicken or whatever. Darwin's theories were what's called natural selection. He said what happens is that this life form, um, say, um, and he used finches, okay? So you have finches on this island and the finches with the short bill, and I'm not sure, I don't remember now whether the short bill, long bill, whatever, but the, just say the short bill. The finches with the short bill were able to survive. Okay, they were su able to survive better because they, the, what the, the seeds they needed to find, they could get them easier with the short bill, whatever. And so since the, the, the finches with the short bill were surviving, they passed on that trait to their offspring and all the other finches with the long bills died. And so what you had is natural selection, right? Survival of the fittest. The fittest was the ones with the short bill. And so natural selection meant it was these that had the short bill that lived while other, others perished. And so that trait got passed on to their offspring and there you have evolution. If you have enough of these that happen, then sooner or later you have a different species to come along. It's nonsense, right? I mean, it's one thing to say that you have one gene that's dominant for short bills that keeps all the offspring have, but to say that all of a sudden this finch becomes a, a chicken or becomes a cat, no, it didn't work that way. The Bible says that God said they, re they will reproduce after their kind, not some other kind. Genesis chapter 1. All right, so the arguments for evolution are, and I think this is about where we got last week. So evolutionists say, here's one, they have about three main arguments for evolution. One is what's known as comparative embryolo embry embryology. Get this out, right? So Darwin first proposed the similarity between the embryos of different animals, because they're so similar, that must be evidence that there was a common ancestry. Somewhere way back there, they all had the same beginning because after all, the embryos all looked the same, right? There was a disciple of Darwin by the name of Ernst Haeckel, I think, Haeckel. He's a German biologist. He popularized the theory that in fact, by looking at the different development stages of these embryos, you could actually see the process of evolution occurring, which he called the biogenetic law. So, you probably have seen this, as I have in my science book when I was in high school years ago, right? How many of you have seen this? Okay, some of you have. Ah, look at that. You have a fish, the embryo of a salamander, a tortoise, a chicken, a hog, a, a calf, and a rabbit, and a human. Look, they all look the same. So we all came from the same source. We all originated the same thing, right? The problem is, and what they don't tell you, they still use these in science books, but nobody tells you they falsified his information. 
he duplicated some of the embryos <laughs> so that it looked the same. He altered his illustrations, those of the colleagues, even going so far as to print the same picture of an embryo three times, labeling one a human, the second a dog, and the third a rabbit. <laughs> and very few scientists nowadays go to this to prove evolution. A fellow by the name of Sir Arthur Kent said, now that the appearance of the embryo at all stages are known, the general feeling is one of disappointment. The human embryo at no stage is anthropoid in appearance. The embryo of the mammal never resembles the worm, the fish, or the reptile. Embryology provides no support for the evolutionary hypothesis. This is from his book, The Human Body. Another fellow, Dr. W.R. Thompson, in his introduction to his 1956 edition of Darwin's Origin of the Species, added, the biogenetic laws of proof of evolution is valueless. And then, I put this one up for you, I think. Wow. So Michael Richardson and his colleagues in a July 1997 issue, Anatomy and Embryology, demonstrated that Haeckel falsified his drawings in order to exaggerate the similarity of the phylotypic stage. In a March 2000 issue of Natural History, Stephen J. Gould, and by the, these are all atheists, by the way. It's not Christians saying this is wrong. These are atheists saying this is wrong. Stephen J. Gould argued that Haeckel exaggerated the similarities by idealizations and omissions. As well, Gould argued that Heichel's drawings are similarly, simply inaccurate and falsified. On the other hand, one of those who criticized his drawings, Michael Richardson, has argued that Heichel's much criticized drawings are important as phylogenetic hypothesis teaching days in evidence for evolution. So did you, before I go further, so basically he's saying it's false information, but well, it's really handy in teaching evolution to kids. But it's not right, but it's too good for teaching evolution. But even Richardson admitted in Science Magazine in 1997 that his team's investigation of Michael's drawings were showing them to be one of the most famous fakes in biology. <laughs> okay. So, so much for the idea of embryology. Um, again, you can still find them in modern biology textbooks and discussions of history of embryology and the clarification these are no longer considered, with no clar clarification that they're no longer valid. If you take, there's something else that, if you go back and think about it, um, even if they were, and they're not, it's false, right? But even if they were simpler, there's something else that's really different about all those. You know what it is? We talked about it last week. The number of chromosomes. Their DNA is different, and you can't change the chromosome from one number of chromosomes from one to another. Remember, humans have one so many, and apes have two less, I think, or two more. And dogs have a bunch of diff more different ones. And so, anyhow, you, know, you can't take, you got to have the same number of chromosomes for the species to multiply, and they don't. All right, so. The other, a second thing that they use for evolution is what's known as vestigal structures. Structures that have no apparent function and appear to be residual parts from a past ancestor are called vestigal structures. Anybody have a, a suggestion? You know what a vest? Can you name one in humans? What? Appendix. Thank you. Appendix. What's that good for? <laughs> they take them out. Wisdom teeth, maybe. Examples of vesicle structures include the human appendix, the pelvic bone in a snake, the wings of a flightless bird, ostrich, what does it need wings for? Okay, so vesicle organs have been one of the classic arguments used as evidence for evolutionists. The argument goes like this, living organisms, including man, contain organs that were once functions, were once functional in the evolutionary past. So in the past, appendix was used for something, 
But now that the evolution has occurred, it's not useful anymore, right? So now use this or have reduced function. This is considered by many to be compelling evidence for evolution. More importantly, vesicle organs are considered by some evolutionists to be evidence against creation because they reason a perfect creator would not make useless organs. Okay, so can you think of, the, of a problem with that? Well, to begin with, how do we know they're useless? Just because we don't know what they're for, maybe we just haven't figured out what they're for right yet, right? And it's interesting that if you, if you go back and you look at all of the vesicle organs they listed in the past, they've, they've started cutting them off the list because they figured out, hey, there's something for that one after all. Okay. Yeah. Now, I think it, in the Down syndrome child, don't they, aren't they missing a chromosome? Can somebody tell me? I'm not really sure about that, but I think so, maybe. And generally when there's some, and I'm not saying in her case, but generally when there's something like that, they, they don't reproduce and carry on the traits, right? To the, we'll get to talking about that in just a moment. But um, <clears throat> again, the main, one of the main things is we don't know what they're for. You know, and they reduce their list as the time goes on and when they, as they study it and they figure out, hey, you know, that did have a use after all. We just didn't know what it was. In, 1990s, in 1971, the Encyclopedia Britannica claimed there were more than 100 vesicle, vesicle organs in man, and even as recently as 1981, some biology textbooks authors were claiming as many as 100 vesicle organs in the human body. One of the most popular current bio, biology textbooks declares that, quote, many species of animals have vesicle organs. Well, there's all kinds of problems with that. First of all, Darwin himself pointed out a few of them. Why would, if it's a vesicle organ, if it's evolving over time, right? And so this organ is no longer being used as a part of the evolutionary process. Why is it still around? It's been around for millions of years. Why has it not disappeared? Here's another one to think about. If in fact, isn't this kind of backwards? I mean, isn't, shouldn't it be the other way around that we're evolving and so as we evolve, we begin to add best of, isn't that a sign that it's evolving and not going the other way? How would you know? The problem is, of course, declaring that it's the main problem is that it doesn't have a function. We don't, we don't really know what the function is. I think I may have a quote up here. Let me see. Evolutionist S.R. Scadding, for example, has critically examined vesicle, vesicle organs as evidence for evolution. He concluded, since it is not possible to unambiguously identify useless structures, and since the structure of that argument used is not scientifically valid, I conclude that vesicle organs provide no special evidence for the theory of evolution. Basically, they don't really prove that, after all. So that's the second main thing, the way they use. And again, if you're looking in the biology book, you'll see those, little, they'll show those pictures. And the third thing is comparative anatomy. Similarities between species point to a common ancestor. So you go to the zoo and you look in the cage and there's the monkey and he's he's got a mouth like you do and he eats like you do and he's got ears like you do and he's got eyes and he's got a nose and he jumps around and acts like you do sometime and so you say hey we must have come from the same ancestor right um well 
again, we recognize some similarities in, uh, in uh, for instance, brothers and sisters. You can look at them, and you can, I can see Mike Sullivan and George Sullivan. You know, I can tell some similarities there. Must have come from the same place. Um, so they say the women must have a common ancestor. The forefoot of a dog, they say, the flipper of a whale, the hand of a man, they all have essentially the same bones, must have the same ancestor. Okay. But nobody denies similarities here, right? But to, to begin with, if you, you what, to accept this as a, a way of proving evolution, you have to do something else. You have to ignore the differences. Chromosomes, for one thing. We already talked about that. DNA differences. But there are other differences as well. In a 1981 visit to the United States, Dr. Colin Patterson, I don't think I've got that up here. Let me see. Oh, nope. Okay. In a 1981 visit to the United States, Dr. Colin Patterson, senior pathologist at the British Museum of Natural History, presented data he said led him to the experience, led him to experience, quote, a shift from evolution as knowledge to evolution as faith. That's what we've been saying all along. It's more of a faith, a belief than anything. What was this evidence? Well, in comparing the amino acid sequences for the alpha hemoglobins of vipers, vipers a snake, right? So comparing the, the amino acid sequence for the alpha hemoglobins of vipers, crocodiles, and chickens, he discovered that the crocodiles were more like the chickens than they were the vipers and other reptile. I mean, so they're supposed to be similar. They have similar origin, but they didn't have, they weren't similar at all. Let me suggest a better explanation. So when we went house hunting a few, not that long, many years ago, we moved to Nashville and we looked at how, for houses. You know what? We found out that most of them have they have bathrooms. Surprising, didn't it? No outhouses. I'm tempted to ask how many of you use an outhouse, but anyhow. Uh, <laughs> a lot of old people in here. <laughs> uh, our church building used to have an outhouse. Anyway, sorry about the deviation there. Um, most of them have bedrooms. They had kitchens. Um, I mean, it had a lot of similarities. Why were they all so similar? Well, because that's an efficient design, right? And the builders figure out, hey, that's a good thing, so we'll do that in every house we build. And people wouldn't buy it if they didn't have them anymore. So maybe God said, you know, arms and hands, they're and feet, they're all pretty efficient. I'll just include them in some other animals I build. Wouldn't that make sense? Why would you recreate everything if you got something that works pretty good? Eyes work pretty good, so I may deviate them a little bit, but I, I give everybody an eye <laughs> or two. Not only that, but in our neighborhood, if you drive around, you know what else you find? A lot of the houses, like ours, have a triangular window. Okay. Well, it's not a very good triangle. But it's a triangular window. You know, what that you know what that says to me? Same guy built all those houses, right, that have a triangular window. It's almost like his calling card. Put a triangular window in there, and everybody know I built that one. So maybe, maybe God is doing a similar sort of thing, right? I mean, uh, if you look at what it is, you say, hey, I've got a calling card. I know who built this. It has a common designer, whatever critter it is, and that designer's God. Well, similarities in that design don't prove that everything evolved from the same cell. They rather suggest that everything had the same designer, a big difference. All right, so there's two major problems for evolution. That's the arguments for evolution, problems for evolution. One is the principles of inheritance. Remember, Darwin said it, that what happened was natural selection, that these, 
individuals, they had a trait that helped them to survive, and since this trait helped them survive, they passed it on to their offspring, and eventually those traits got kept passing on until you had this new species. So there's two possibilities for how that evolution occurred. One of them was natural selection, like Darwin suggested, or the other possibility is mutations. You know what a mutation is, right? That's where you get hit with uh, so many uh, ultraviolet rays from your microwave, and the next thing you know, you're going things out of your hand and face and also something like that, right? So it's something that is unusual for whatever reason, some odd thing. Um, have you all ever seen a white squirrel? Okay, so there are two kinds of white squirrels. Where I'm from in Kennedy, Tennessee, there is a, you go through the town and there are white squirrels everywhere. But that's not, it's not a mutation, that's just the way they are. They have that gene for whiteness there, or lack of gene for blackness, I guess. But you could have a mutated squirrel that was white. We call those albino, right? And they used to have red eyes and look real scary. So a mutation is something that happens. It's not, it's not the normal. So how did the, the traits come about to change one animal into another? Was it natural selection or was it a mutation? How long would it take? For instance, if you were using natural selection, how long would it take to get all the nine million species of animals just by, because good genes were passed on from one to the next. You'd be around an awful long time, wouldn't you? And you're beginning to understand, by the way, why for evolutionists, the Earth has to be really, 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 really old. And so they keep making it older and older because it's got to be old to have enough time for evolution to occur, right? I'm going to talk about the dating process here in a minute. <laughs> so, most scientists now argue if they don't like Darwin's natural selection. They say what actually happened was mutation. That's how you count for all of the things that happen, uh, the traits being passed on. Mutations, Thompson writes, are simply hereditary changes caused by alterations to the organic genetic material. We don't know how that happened, some odd thing. So we're told that nature has selected beneficial mutations. Mutations came along, happened to this organism. It was a beneficial, it made it better. It grew a third eye, it developed wings, whatever. And so that beneficial mutation got passed on then to its descendants. And if enough of those mutations happen, then it turns into a whole different species, right? Yeah, as I, I talk about this, I, I'm, just, I'm just, man, people believe this? Really? Okay. So they eventually caused these organisms to change into, from one to another. Um, in his book, Life and Introduction to Biology, I don't remember how many of these I put up there. Oh, okay. So in his book, Life and Introduction to Biology, evolutionist George Simpson wrote, Muta mutations are the ultimate raw materials for evolution. Mutation, that's how it happened. There are, of course, some real problems here. One is that mutations are pretty random. I mean, who knows when a mutation is gonna come along and what kind of mutation it's gonna be and if it's even gonna pass on. Far from selecting, quote unquote, what traits to pass on to the next generation, mutations occur very randomly. Consequently, what gets passed on is also completely random may not be good at all, right? Secondly, mutations are not only random, but they're rare. 
They don't come along very often. Again, you begin to see why the earth has to be really, really old because <laughs> if a mutation is going to come on, it gets passed on, and they're pretty rare, it's got to be really old for enough mutations to happen for nine million species to come, right? Dr. Um, F.J. Ayala, Ayala, an evolutionary genesis, geneticist, Genesis, an evolutionary geneticist states, it is probably fair to estimate the frequency of a majority of mutations in higher organisms between one in 10,000 and one in, ten, one in a million per, per gene, per gene, per generation. So just one gene, like hair color. <laughs> a mutation may come along one in a million every generation just for one gene. But you tell me I've got to have enough genetic changes to change this to a completely different life form? Mutations are random and mutations are rare, but there's one other thing. I think my battery's leaving here. Good mutations are extremely rare. Because a lot of the mutations are happen, that happen are, they're not good at all. They don't make the species better. They hurt the species, right? And make things worse. Neutral mutations don't hurt or help either. So the question is how often do good mutations occur? Dr. H.J. Mueller, Nobel Laureate in Genetics, according to the great majority of mutations, certainly well over 99% are harmful in some way, as to be expected of the effects of accidental occurrences. Now, you've got to have a good mutation, which is very rare to begin with, for this to happen. And most of the things that are going to happen are going to make your species worse, not better. Um, well, let me, I'm going to take this down because you'll read that. Dr. C.P. Martin, an evolutionist, said, according mutations are more than just sudden changes in heredity, they also affect viability, and to the best of our knowledge, uh, invariably affect it adversely. They don't help, they hurt. Okay, one other one. Dr. Simpson admitted that, quote, if there was an effective breeding population of 100 million individuals, and they produced a new generation daily, every day, 100 million pop of the population produces. The likelihood of obtaining good evolutionary results from mutations could be expected only about <laughs> once in 274 billion years. But you're telling me that we had enough good mutations to occur that we transformed one species into a completely different one, and then into another one, and to another one, until you had nine million different ones? How many years would that take? It takes a lot of faith to believe in this, doesn't it? There's another problem for evolution. It's not just the principle of inheritance. How does it happen? But then there's the fossil record. Everybody knows what a fossil is, right? I'm not talking about some old guy. What you find in the dirt, you dig it up and it looks like a... Has anybody here ever found a fossil? Yeah, good. We we'll say up around uh, where we used to live in Adamsville, there's a mound there where you can find a lot of those fossils. Um, Dr. LaGrosse Clark, a renowned evolutionist, wrote that evolution actually did occur, can only be scientifically, 
scientifically established by the discovery of the fossilized remains of representative samples of those intermediate types which have been postulated on the basis of the indirect evidence. In other words, if a monkey actually turned into a man, then you should be able to go into the fossil record and find at different stages, right? A monkey that's a little bit more like a man, a monkey that's a little, little bit more like a man, one that's a little bit more like a man, different intermediate stages until you finally get to the man, right? And you can put them all together and say, there they are. Same for dinosaurs to birds, which is, by the way, most people, the ones who believe in this, believe dinosaurs eventually turned into birds or whatever else, transformation. You've got to have in the fossil record some evidence that this happened, right? And you'd expect to find that. In addition, if the evolution model is true, then one would expect that the older, deeper layers of the Earth would yield the oldest form of life. Right? You get down lower in the earth digging, and that's where you find the monkey that's more like the monkey. And as you get up, up, it becomes more like the man until you get to the top. Then it really is the man. And from there, as one investigated geological data, they would find more and more complex life, including some transition forms. Darwin said, quote, the number of intermediate and transitional links between all living and extinct species must have been inconceivably great. Must be a bunch of them out there. So what do we actually find in the fossil record? Do we find a bunch of them? Do we find a bunch of intermediate state animals? In the Cambrian rocks, one finds every one of the invertebrate forms that even vertebrates have been found there. So you get to the oldest layer and guess what you find? You don't just find the oldest you find all of them. They're all there. They were all around <laughs> from the very beginning. Not just part of them. What does he find in the next lower level? Well, the Cambrian rock, a distinct absence of any fossils. No intermediate forms, no less complex fossil remains. What one discovers an abrupt change in the level from one fossil. So in, if you go down low enough, you find these, looks like really primitive in the next layer, you find all, the, all of the there's, there's no intermediate stages anywhere in there. And that's a problem for evolutionists because there needs to be a fossil record that shows intermediate stages. Dr. John Klotz writes, it is hardly conceivable that all the forms should have originated in this period and yet there's no evidence of the existence of many of them prior to this Cambrian period. In an article from the Institute for Creation Research, May of 1981, it stated I don't know if I got this in there or not. Mm, nope, getting ahead of myself. Okay. In an article from the Institute for Creation Research, May of 1981, it stated, quote, None of the intermediate fossils that would be expected on the basis of the evolution model have been found between single-celled organisms and invertebrates. Between invertebrates and vertebrates, between fish and amphibians, between amphibians and reptiles, between reptiles and birds or mammals, or between laurel mammals and, and uh, primates. They don't find anything in the fossil record. S.J. Gould in Natural History, June of 19, July of 1977, writes, all paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. But we're supposed to believe this evolution happened even though there's not any proof that it happened. No transitional forms. David Kitts in Evolution, September of 1974, wrote, despite the bright promise that paleontology provides a means of seeing evolution, it has presented some nasty difficulties for evolutionists, the most notorious of which is the presence of the gaps in the fossil record. Evolution requires intermediate forms between species, and paleontology does not provide them. So, so much for the fossil record showing that evolution has occurred. 
By the way, let me just throw this in real briefly. So when I was in Africa back in 2005, Tanzania, they took us. I went on a little safari up in um, to, um, well, to Serengeti. And they took us, the driver took us by, I can't pronounce it. This is, I'm just thinking of this on the top of my head. Uh, a Glovey Gorge, something like that. It's where Leakey supposedly discovered the missing link, the man that was part eight and part. You know what he actually discovered? Anybody know? He discovered a jawbone. He got a jawbone. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute now. You've seen the picture, right? Monkey going up and becoming man. So they must have found all those different forms, right? No. They found a jawbone. A few pieces of crushed skull, maybe, on some other places. And from that, some artists drew up the, this evolutionary process. I have no idea where that came from or if it, how accurate it is. But they want us to believe that it's factual. Why well, it is fact? Got to be. Let me just, very briefly, the dating process. I don't know if I'll have time for this or not. In fact, I think I'll stop there. Aubrey's up here on the front row. <laughs> so I'll stop right there. Okay? Just one. <laughs> yeah. So, so why would you go to this whole process of coming up with evolution if you got the Bible right? But the, as you, if you remember when we started this, the answer is in Romans 1. Where the Bible says, God says, I was manifest to them that could clearly see I existed from everything around them, from the sky, from their own bodies. But the, Paul said, they did not want God in their knowledge. You take God out of the picture, they've got to somehow now account, if it's not God, how do you account for the existence? of mankind and there, and there was a big bang and out of nothing there sprang life and then you had all this evolution to come that's how we came to be and so they don't have to acknowledge God if they do that wouldn't it be simpler just to take the Bible and say well here it is right here it makes a lot better sense and that will be a good place for me to stop and offer an invitation I guess to you there is a God, a God who loves you. Let me see if I can get through this. Oh, no. Okay. How do you turn this off? Can you do that? Oh, I can't. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I can't. Yeah, you just have to skip on down because I've got like 500 more slides in there. It'd take the rest of the night just to fast forward through there. Anyway, there is a God, and we know he exists. David says, you can look up in the sky, the stars, the heavens speak to you. God is real. And you stop, just look up on the cross, you can see something else. God loves you, and he wants you to be with him eternally in heaven. And that's possible for all of us. If we're willing to put our faith and trust in him and do what he tells us in, our, in his word, come confessing our belief in him, repenting of our sins, being baptized for the remission of those. Or maybe if we're New Testament Christians, aren't you so glad that he gave us this? He must have known we were going to struggle and stumble every now and then, but he said, said in 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our faults, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
wonderful promise. If we're willing to confess those, turn back to God, He can forgive us. It's your choice tonight. But we hope that you'll make sure your relationship with the Lord is what it should be. We'll give you that opportunity to do that while we stand and sing. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed. He will not turn thee away. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is pleading, oh, list to his voice. Hear him today, hear him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice, quickly arise and away. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. <clears throat> Our closing song will be number 297. Number 297, I want to be a worker for the Lord. <clears throat> and after this, we'll have our closing prayer. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work. I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker strong and brave. I want to trust in Jesus' power to save. All who will truly come shall find a happy home in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, thank you for the privilege to be here tonight to worship you in public, uh, in person, and in spirit and in truth. Thank you for being our God and being our Father and being our Creator. And we pray that you will open the eyes of our hearts and the hearts of our fellow Nashvillians. Wherever we look, we should be able to see your fingerprints and your footprints and your handiwork. It's all around us. And we pray also that others may look at our lives and see your handiwork. And we may be an influence for good and draw other people to you. Hallelujah, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, now, it vibrates when it moves, but now, let me show you. Uh, we really need a, a next one, don't we, so we can come out when it runs out. Hey, we we like to never got this one. <laughs> really? <laughs> there should be. I guess okay. I can just run here up here you, and here start you, using it. Here them. you go. Right here, probably once a month, we probably need to, well, hey, we could do it. In the, not, yeah, there you go. And if it been, if we had, if it, it won't take batteries, if it did, I would have <laughs> jumped up here and and helped you. I thought, oh, oh. but anyhow, hey, well, and what it, I should have done and, is just come up here and start using that. And it's not supposed to take a minute to give a uh, quick charge one minute for three hours of use. Wow. So, so, so if I don't wherever they would, but hey, anyhow. Yeah. Well, you were good. But I enjoy it. I really do, the, the last thing. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, that's a, an interesting problem I didn't think about. But if I've got, like, a gazillion slides and I'm only using part of them, but I've got them all in here, you pretty much has to come up here. No, and, I think There's no you, way to skip them all, is it? There is. You know, all right, for instance, if it's up here ready to go, I think you could hit escape. The screens won't show anything, then you could just move it, or he could do it, Aubrey, but he's just not that, he, does, he's not, he doesn't know, you know, that much. In other words, that's like, right now it would be on the wall, on the monitors, and so uh, if you wanted to just bypass, just hit escape. Yeah, you just have to get out of it yeah. and go down. And, and, and then go that. down and then go back. Yeah, so and that would do it. I wasn't, I couldn't see what to go. What did he do? Did he just. <laughs> he went off? forward. But he, he went, went forward so <laughs> fast we didn't see him. So oh, you're good to go. Because I had like, he did. I had like well, 500 he, of yeah, them. Yeah, but. There, uh, oh, and he man. did real good. Real good. Uh, let me show you. I would think. I, I'm not sure how it. Oh, okay. You just hold this. The, you know, these are the ones that yeah. move it. Yeah. So he just went like that. I think his went quicker than that. But oh, okay. anyhow, yeah, so. <laughs> now next Wednesday though, will you be I'll here? I'll be gone next right. Wednesday. Right, that's what I thought. The one I'll, after that, I'll yeah, you'll be back. back and talk about. Dinosaurs. But then after that one, you'll I'll be, be gone, gone for about four, six weeks. Six weeks. Okay, yeah. we're good. I just didn't know. You know, we'll leave it. Well, we'll, we'll start it. Uh, so. and, and I tell you what, let's uh, uh, let, let's. Uh, Let's just see. It does vibrate when it's working. You see, it just doesn't seem to be. Whoops, what in that? What was that? <laughs> uh, what did, wait a minute. Oh, okay. So I am moving. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if it was moving or not. I did order even another one for a backup. That might be simpler for both of us that uses batteries. And I'll try to bring it. But I gotta go upstairs and turn that off. One thing is my you, you were gonna show me the thing about how to get it when I moved it over. There was something button that you could push to get it to accept a different format. Uh-huh. When you paste it, we, we probably... Oh, okay, is this it right here? This is mine, and that's his. Okay. You want to see how I do them now? I just click on that one, and then hit Select All, uh, Copy, yeah. and then go over here, and if I'm going to paste it right there, just hit Paste. Now, there should be, you see this little bitty thing right there that shows up? That a star? 
They, no. Right. Oh, at the top. Oh, yeah. Now watch right here when I click on the mouse. It says keep source formatting. Oh. When I've learned that was a word, and hey, I just learned this like the last month, but that kept everything together after I'd learned to do that. See, it's still up there. Mm -hmm. Now, the only way to get it, you can't, you, you have to, you have to insert it. You have to go down here, you know, after you've copied all of yours, mm -hmm. and you have to go up here under edit and hit, uh, well, you got to be under the program, and hit paste. Mm -hmm. That puts that little bitty thing up there, and then keep Source formatting. Okay. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna mm -hmm. put this and put don't save that way. Oh, okay. It keeps it. I'm gonna go turn that off. Okay.